Thanks, Graham. Good morning, or maybe good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Graham said, I work for DuPont. I'm based in Denmark. On a regular basis, I talk with either colleagues or customers in the States, Europe, India, basically all over the world. So although food is uh, local, science, and that's where we are today, is global. And that's what I want to talk to you about. What I've been tasked with is talking about food's next 40 years, a potentially dangerous subject since I'm going to have to go into the future, and that's not usually a wise place to go. What I've tried to do here is go 40 years back. This is what the kind of food we had when I was a kid. And then I'm going 40 years forward, and is this the kind of food that we're going to get in the next 40 years? Here we have some sort of mealworm pies, and we have some sort of frankenfruit. Is that really where we're going? The theme of the talk is not really to explore the science. The theme of the talk is really to have a look at the mechanics of how we do the science and how we get there in the next 40 years. So I'm not going to talk molecules. I'm going to talk more strategy. I might talk a little bit of philosophy. And ultimately, I want to provoke you. Sometimes I'll be a little bit nasty. Sometimes I might be a little bit funny. But I want you to get the grey cells working and try and find out what steps we, as a scientific community, have to take in order to get to the next 40 years. No, nope, we'll do it that way. OK, the population explosion. There is no hidden agenda here. We know that the population of the planet is increasing. We know it's going rapidly uphill. And by around about 2050, we might hit the 9, maybe 10 billion mark if nothing happens at the moment. That's a lot more from where we are today. Uh, four years ago, when I actually wrote the article that's given me the, the, the inspiration for this talk, we were around about 7 billion. So we're going to increase 2 billion in the next 35, 40 years. That's a huge increase. This is what a train can look like today. Imagine what it's going to look like when we get to 2050. There is a certain set of guidelines that we can approach and use to try and address this problem. These stones, I think they stand in Alabama, and they're written in all different languages. But for today's purpose, we'll keep it in English. So it says here, maintain humanity under 500 million and in perpetual balance with nature. Now, if we think about that, 500 million is somewhere around about here. So we've clearly got a long way to go before we can hit that target. And it's probably not realistic. We want to guide production wisely and improve fitness and diversity within the environment. And we want to unite humanity within a new living language. Strange words and how do we actually address them? The insight that I got from this report that came out in 2011 was basically the, the reason that I wrote the article four years ago. It's freely available on the internet. It's called The Foresight Report, The Future of Food and Farming. Uh, you can read it. It's about 200, 250 pages long. There is a, an executive summary, which shortens it down for the main conclusions. And what you see in the text is, by and large, the main conclusions that they came to. We need to balance future demand and supply sustainably. In other words, we're looking for affordable food. We want to ensure an adequate stability of the food supply. And not just food supply, but the food supply chain. We want to achieve global access to food and end hunger. That could be a little bit ambitious. It's, an, it's a laudable goal, but do we really want to get there? Well, we want to get there, but will we really manage it? Open question. We want to mitigate the food system's impact on the climate through efficient management. We've also already heard this morning that there have been talks to try and get into this down here and how can we do things in a more environmentally friendly way? Can we manage that? We also want to maintain biodiversity and the ecosystem services whilst feeding the world. So we're trying to link all of this into a sustainable system without impacting the climate that's going to give us global access to food, maybe ending hunger, that's a, that's a teaser. We want to ensure the adequate supply, and then we're all going to do that in an affordable price. That's the goal, and we have, when I wrote it, 40 years to get there. Four years have passed, so we've got 36 years left. The challenge starts now. How do we get there? 
So picking up a, a small phrase from the, the now late baseball legend, Yogi Berra, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So there we are. We're here now, and depending on which way we choose, will depend on what sort of environment we're going to live in in the next 36 years. What we need to do is address, insta uh, how can we say, we need to address facets of technology. We need to look at culture. We need to look at morals, we need to look at ethics, and we need to look at values. Now, the last section that I talked about there, why are they coming into this room? Because we're all up here. By and large, we're all scientists. So we have no axe to grind in culture, morals, ethics, or values. They're soft subjects. But it's the soft subjects that we're going to have to play with if we're going to manage to get the right technology in order to change this thing down here, the world view that we have. How do we view the world that we have today compared to how we view the world that we're going to have in 36 years time or in 40 years time? And we've already heard it a little bit today. There's this little button that's missing on most of our keyboards. It's all there, but it just says something different on our keyboards today. If I look down here, it says shift. So we need to have paradigm in front of it. We're going to have to change certain things that we hold dear if we're going to make this succeed. That then leads me to a, a, a little bit of a dichotomy. How do we change the way we're thinking? So I put this bold statement up here. Success is depending on creating something that people want, not what people need. Creating what people need never usually gets you anywhere. And the simple example is this thing. Nobody needed one of these. And in about 10 years ago, they didn't really exist in the same format that they have today. But now everybody wants one. Maybe everybody has one. And maybe everyone has an iPad too, and now they want a three, and then there's going to be a four. The need has been created, and now everybody wants it. Okay? Nobody wants the iPad, but everybody's going to need it. And now you're beginning to think, what is the iPad? The iPad's actually an equation. The impact over here is equal to the population of the world, multiplied by the affluence factor, multiplied by the technology factor. You can commonly find it in the Ehrlich equation. That's essentially what this is. What we're looking at here is that the impact here is the impact on the earth or the environment. We know that the population is going through the roof. It's already gone there and it's not showing any signs of coming down. We know that affluence in the Western world is reasonably high, but the affluence in the developing world is also becoming higher rapidly. That factor there is also on the increase and that's the affluence factor what is the impact on the environment as a result of the affluence of your lifestyle? We all have cars, we all have fridges. If you go to the developing worlds, they may not have cars, they may not have fridges, but they want one. And at the moment, the affluence factor is kicking in and that's going to increase radically. Then we come to the technology, technology factor here. That is the impact that the technology has on the environment. At the moment, we're trying to drive that down. So through more judicious use of technology, we can actually reduce the impact on the environment. And if we do that properly, we end up coming back to a number here, depending on how you calculate those. If you can get one underneath four, then the chances are we might break even. And at the moment, we're heading in the wrong direction. We'll come back to that as we go through the slides. So this is the need that we are going to have. And ultimately, we're going to end up wanting this. We need to make that work. Otherwise, our lives are going to take a drastic turn in the next 40 years. What I want to go through now is a range of thoughts and conclusions <laughs> that came out of the, the Foresight Report. Uh, and then I've put my own interpretation on them based on the insights and the work we've done in, in our own company and also the interactions that we have with our customers. Invest in new knowledge. 
okay, that sounds easy. Spread the best practice. Great. What happens if you live in this kind of world here? You're in a silo. You're only concerned about your own company or you're only concerned about your own division or you're only concerned about your own balance sheet at the end of the year. I want earnings. You don't collaborate with this silo. You compete against it. What we have to do is foster an environment where true multidisciplinarity comes in. Each of these silos is probably very, very good at what it does. Can you imagine what it would be like if each of these silos actually corresponded and collaborated with each other? Then you would begin to get to a section where you're creating real inter interdependent teams. And that's what we have here. I could have picked another picture, but the dog is actually winning out of this one because this little kid is pushing the button and the dog can get a drink. Both can't do it themselves. So then the, the obvious question is, but what can the dog do for the kid? It can do something else later. And there's clearly an interdependence in this relationship here that is working very well. These two entities here are collaborating and collaborating effectively. That brings me down to this one. Not only do we create these interdependent teams, but we want to go on and create things like multi-partner consortia. What does that mean? At the moment, typically you have a collaboration which is hub and spoke. So you have the, the centre, and you have the centre reaching out to a range of different collaborators. And these collaborators all feed back in to the centre, but they don't cross-collaborate over here. So the, the level of diversity is higher than you have in this picture, but it's not half as high as you have up here. If you have a multi-partner consortium, then each individual partner can collaborate with each other, share data, share results. Dare I say it, share IP. There's legal challenges involved here. So there's a whole range of different things that have to happen before this really begins to fly. But it's happening. It's happening now. And the world is gradually changing. And then I put this one in, just as a little teaser. Embrace intelligent discretion. What does that mean? Anybody who's read the, the, the works of Richard Dawkins, um, who's a controversial figure in his own right, he's put forward the idea of, can we have intelligent discretion? Does that mean that we can create a set of uh, legal criteria, a set of, of codex, if you want, that says we are guided towards doing the right thing. Not doing what we have to do. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing might not be beneficial for this silo, but it might actually work for these three. But if you're sitting in that silo there, you probably don't want to do the right thing. You want to fight against it. And you'll have legal systems that will back you up. Can we change that and soften up the regulations, regulatory, legal systems, while still maintaining, of course, a good code that we can do business properly? It's a question, it's not a statement of fact. We need to make sustainable production central to the development of food ingredients or foods. So we want to move away from the Cinderella's ugly sister, where this car is quite obviously not fitting very well into the back of this truck. It sort of just gets there. But it's not fantastic. And we want to move away into this one, into the Goldilocks's porridge. And this is our little planet here, Earth, and we're in the green zone. Everything is just nice. So if, we are, if we're making a new food ingredient, do we go for this one? Because, well, it, it does the job and it fits. And everything's good, apart from the sustainability could be a little bit better or the clean processing hasn't quite got there or there, there's technology that may be able to be improved but it hasn't quite made it. But it's doing the job and we can earn money out of it. Dollars are good. Plants are bad. OK, provocative statement. Can you eat dollars, though? No, you can't. You can eat plants. If you do it this way, or if you begin to change the ethos of thinking to go to that way, then you get into this sort of problem. 
You might have a plan B. And as we go back into the, or move to the, the front of the, the talk, to the, the, the conclusions, we'll end up seeing that there, there is no planet B. We're stuck with this one that we have. It's quite a good one. We like it. But there is only one. We also want to promote sustainable intensification. This is supposed to represent the goddess Gaia. Okay? Gaia is the goddess of Earth. She looks after the planet. She's doing a pretty good job. And then we came along. And we're doing our level best to screw it up. So if we can manage to do that and go into this statement, if we can include the environment into food system economics, can we effectively create Gaia's nicotine patch? You know, here she's blowing air. You could imagine that this is smoke. So can you get her to stop smoking? Can we give her a nicotine patch through changing the way in which we work, through changing the way in which we can create and, and, and collaborate within our innovation circles? Can we get to a stage where we can garner industry, governments and NGOs together? so that they can work with each other. There's a novel thought. I'm coming from a company that's up here, and yet I'm saying this. Do DuPont really want to work with NGOs? There's a scary thought. Why not? What have we got to lose? Why does it always have to be an us and them status? Imagine if we could change the the system, the paradigm of working, so that we actually create this kind of environment. Let's take the strength from each organization and move it forward. Does that sound too, too drastic? Let's move on. Two evocative pictures up here. We need to reduce waste. We've also been hearing about that today. Which one are you most likely to respond to? This one tugs at the heartstrings, but honestly, after you've seen it, five minutes when you go out the door, you've forgotten about it, and you're not going to change your habits. It's emotive, yes. It might reach your hand into your pocket and draw out a pound or two or three, or not. This one, can we do something about that? Yes, we can. Yes, we are. <coughs> if we look at what's written here, it says 25% of all food wastage is spoiled by microorganisms. Imagine if you could reduce that by 50%. Just that 25%. Reduce that by 50%, so half that. The amount of tons of food that you would actually save, which could be used for something else. We know that there are companies out there that are committed to zero landfill, so we're doing something about this. <coughs> that is also happening. It's happening in this country, and it's doing so very successful. It is also happening throughout the rest of Europe, and I'm pretty sure there will be similar schemes in the States that are doing likewise. What are we doing in order to get that to that stage? We are trying to go up in here and look at what's going on in specifically things like packaging. Can we design packaging so that more of the food stuff that was in the packaging actually comes out? When you guys go and buy a bottle of ketchup or a bottle of mayonnaise, typically there will be about 20% of your mayonnaise still in there when you decide to throw the thing out. That's a lot. If you were able to reduce that, then you're immediately able to reduce a range of food wastage. So one thing that we could possibly look at is leveraging the food and packaging industries together. Not that we don't already do that but can we do it in a smarter way today? Can we also explore non-chemical? And the reason I've put them in sort of inverted commas is that everything that we do is based in chemistry at some stage or other, but we're looking for this thing called natural. Can we do anything there to increase the, the use of non-chemical? In other words, can we get to natural antimicrobials that we can put onto the, the label so that the consumers can be happy? Because that's what they want. That's what everybody's telling us. There's a flip side to that, though. How many of the consumers actually want to pay for the natural? Zero. They want the same functionality, but they do not want to dig their hand in the pocket. 
And then it leads us to a, a question that we need to ask ourselves as a, as a supply company, and it leads us as a question that we need to ask together with our customers. Who is chasing whose tail here? How much resource and innovation do we want to put into, not just the antimicrobials, it could be the whole clean label. How much do we really want to put into that contra the return that we're going to get? So there we are, we're back to thinking in our silos and I want to earn my money. Yes, try and get around and get out of that. We want to improve the evidence base upon which decisions are made. And then we want to try and communicate that towards the people. And the key message there is try and keep it simple. If you go in and read some of your psychology uh, literature, you'll find out that there's a couple of papers, uh, approximately eight to ten years old now, I think, that says if it's difficult to pronounce, it must be risky. Or alternatively, if you write it in a strange font, in Comic Sans, for example, or, or some of the Gothic fonts, what are you trying to hide? It's suddenly now become difficult to read. Make the communication easy and keep it simple. Then the chances are you can have your audience on board. Communication, as we all know, is 70% me standing here and what I'm doing with, with my body language, 15% of what's coming out of my mouth, and it's so important that I can't even remember what the last few percentage is. <laughs> body language is huge. How do you actually meet your world? And then what sort of language do you use when you're actually promoting it? Body language in terms of the written is the font that you're looking at and the language style that you use. Okay? Then we come to this one. This is the real tricky one, as far as we're concerned. We've got two characters there, and they say, that was a very laid out rational point. Excellent, okay, we agree. But I still hold on to my emotional based opinion of no facts and no evidence. So you can say whatever you want, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do what I want to do anyway. And there's a little bit of laughter in the audience and that means that it's, it's, it's resonating with the chord. So what do we have to do to create a, an, a, an environment for the next 40 years? Do we have to rationalize emotions? Can we do that? Or do we have to emotionalize rationality? Because we have to speak to that issue there. We have to address that. If we cannot address that, we run the risk of doing a lot of innovation, which may not ultimately end up meeting the needs of what it was there to serve in the first place. And this next picture is, is a, little bit, um, a little bit provocative against the females of the audience, and I apologize for that. It was, it, it was, it was not designed to be sexist, it was designed to show that bloggers in their nature tend to write a lot of things. So don't look at a female figure here, just look at a figure. A lot of things in here. And we have to actually outblog then. Who is it that is best and trained and tuned to communicate science to the outside world? Here you are. You're in this room. How many of us actually take the chance to do that? Oh, well, I publish papers and I write book chapters. Yeah. How many of the public actually read those? Zero, I would imagine. On the contrary, and now I'm going to pick in because I'm back in Britain, so I can, I can do that. I'm going to pick on the Daily Mail. How many write and respond to the Daily Mail when they come out with their great big program of Frankenfood? Come on, hands up. Nobody. You're all sitting there with valuable information in your heads, but nobody actually takes the action to do that. That's why this bit here is controversial, yes, but we almost have a moral duty in order to get this to work. We are the brains of the next 40 years, whether we like it or not. We have the ability to communicate <coughs> to the public whether we like it or not. The question is, will the public believe us? Because they're holding on to this. How do we turn that one round so that the public actually begins to buy into what we're saying? Whose benefit are we there for? Is it benefit up there? DuPont? Put your own company name there? 
put your own research institute there? Are you the guys that's going to get the benefit? Or are you going to pass that benefit on to the public? <clears throat> and it all comes down to outblogging them and keeping your communication simple. There's the challenge. One of the other things that came through from the report uh, was this stuff. Water. We take it for granted. We can drink it. It's clean. It tastes good. But we need to anticipate the supply issues of clean water, and we need to do it now. There's another 2 billion people coming into the world in the next 30, 40 years. They are going to need as much water as I need. I think nothing about, I'm not going to do it because I'll respect the building that I'm in, but I could think nothing about just throwing that over my shoulder because I know there's a jug of the stuff outside and I can go and get some more. That is wastage. We need to address this issue now. And what I've tried to do with this image is we need to address it from both points. We need water for manufacture, so that's why we've got some sort of turbine down here. And we also need it for drinking. That's why we, it sort of transmutes itself into, into water up here. We also need it for food production. We also need it for cooking. We need it for cleaning. We need water for, let's face it, we need water for life. Let's address these issues now. How do we manage that? Even thinking about what to do with water, you're going to have to create new, creative and disruptive technology. And what I mean by disruptive is that you actually make a, a quantum leap forward in the way you're looking at and, and managing the, 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 the research that you're doing. How do you actually place in mechanisms new ways to make sure that these hands in 2015 can be transferred to another set of hands in 2040, 2050, and still have water in there and meet the needs of the growing planet? The reason I've brought this one up is that that is going to become a critical issue as we go forward. There are trains of thought out there that says that armed conflict could actually be over water supply. And the next one's a little bit of a spoiler. So if you want to keep your, 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 your film, shall we say, secrets safe, shut your eyes during the next one. We don't need any of his help. This is now a reasonably old film. But if you go back and you watch that, that was all about water. It wasn't about oil. It wasn't about energy, it was about water supply. And the world, as it always does in film land, the world nearly ended because of someone else controlling the water supply. That kind of armed conflict we want to avoid. There's enough armed conflict in the world. We don't need another one on something as simple but as precious as water. This is what I said earlier on about coming back to the planet. There's no planet B. We need to change the consumption patterns that we operate on today. Here we are in the affluent West. Anybody from America here? That's a relief. Anybody from the UK here? <laughs> yeah, there's a few of us. So it says here, this is, a, this is a rather old slide now, but it fits with the article I wrote back in 2011 because the numbers are still the same. How many planets would we need if everybody, every resident in the country, lived the same way as the US, you'd need five. You've only got one, you need another four, right? Back then, the UK was at 3.4. So we've still got a deficit of two and a half or 2.4. And then there's some other countries down here. I would imagine that those two are on the change. I can see that deficit's gonna come in for both China and India fairly soon, if it hasn't already reached that stage because they are no longer developing countries, they are the next middle class powerhouses in both countries. So the world average some four years ago was that we, we needed another 0.4 of a, of a planet. So let, you know, let's go and colonize the moon. Let's go and live on Mars. We, we, need, we, need, we can't do it here. And that's because the population is increasing. That's because the affluence of the population 
is increasing or the affluence impact on the climate. And that's because the technology that we operate today plainly isn't good enough to meet that demand there. So as well as doing all of the things I've just talked about, the report also said you should embrace a, 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 or foster an environment to empower the people. Power to the people. And there's a few people in this room that might actually remember this, and there's a few that will go straight over their heads. But however, how many remember Citizen Smith? Power to the people, right? That's, that's what we need. But we're, we're not in Citizen Smith's world. We're in our world, and we need to empower them so that we can get rid of this deficit here and pop back there. Otherwise, there's going to be a disaster of unmitigated proportions if we don't address this. Coming to the end, and I'm probably a bit quick on the time, but I'm hoping that we're going to end up with dialogue, because coming to the end, from my many questions, I've actually managed to come forward with very few answers. And that wasn't the aim of this talk. But we do want to change the culture of, yes, but we tried. How often do we say that? Didn't we recognize that? Next time you go into an ideation session, yeah, no, yeah, but we tried that. It doesn't work. Change that culture to, imagine if we could. What if? Wouldn't that be good if? And the discussion now starts with you. And I'll stop there. This is the point I'd like to make about um, food companies, NGOs, government. Yeah? Risky. Why aren't they as influential as celebrities in influencing dietary change? Because if you look in social media, the big influence in the, in say in particular, like the gluten-free market, has been two celebrities, which were Gwyneth Paltrow and Novak Djokovic. And we've just been doing some research where we look at the aspects about food security, sustainability, mm -hmm. people doing like Meatless Monday. And the, the, the numbers are insignificant compared with the influence that um, their pronouncement about the gluten-free market, how uh, that increased the amount of Twitter traffic and consumer awareness within Twitter sphere. Yeah? I mean, you're, 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 hitting a, you're hitting a target there, which clearly is, at the moment, I think, underdeveloped. Um, <laughs> one thing that I haven't put into this talk, because it, it didn't actually form part of the, the article that I wrote, but there's a, there's a concept that is quite heavy in Scandinavia, where, where I'm based now, and I think there is also issues of it coming into the UK, called nudging, where you don't tell people what to do, but you guide them. And you, you're guiding them into what we all hope is the yeah. right choice. But you're guiding them into a way of behaving, which could change the behaviour. Mm. Now, we had, we had Tim talking about corn this morning. How do you get people to eat corn? Oh, you've been eating it for years. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know. But how do you, how do you get that behaviour to become more mainstream? Can you do it through marketing? Yes, you can. Can you do it through advertising? <clears throat> yes, you can. Can you do it through communication? Probably. But the effective thing is grabbing the people so that you actually embrace that picture there. Get hold of their emotions. And if you can do that through a celebrity, yeah. perfect. So can I add another one? You certainly. Yeah. So d the, there's a topic called design thinking, mm -hmm. design innovation. And um, the, one of the best examples is the, is, is the We Fit. And um, so a what was happening in um, the context of uh, children Game, uh, using game, uh, the Game Boy and the Playstations and becoming very, very sedentary, not getting outside. So awareness within Sony ab about, about this uh, uh, concern. And to change the paradigm was to make uh, the Wii Fit, a very small technical change, but making this... Um, changing from PlayStation to a Wii Fit is about 
involving the family, involving mm. the group, getting people to be active, and it's a total juxtaposition, but that's, that was the change, and they took all the noise away mm -hmm. from the PlayStation and the Game Boy. Yeah. And that was a, a piece of design thinking I mean, I and think, design innovation. I think embracing what you said there is <clears> the <throat> fact that I, I said one of the mantras at the start of the talk where I said that, that food is local and, and science is global. Mm. This problem is global. Yeah. Therefore, it's not my problem. It's not your problem, and it's nobody's problem in this room. But when you put it all together, it is our problem. And what you've just hit the, head, hit, hit the nail on the head there is that you've, you've, you've taken that problem and brought it down and involved some other people, and they can actually see that there is influence for them and there is benefit for them. You know, forget what the neighbours are doing. Mm. We don't care about them. But if they did embrace this, that would be good for them too. Yeah. But you're, you're creating a, a need or you're creating a benefit for yeah. you. Yeah, a new need. Yes, yeah. a new need for you as a person. Yeah. I'm not doing this to save the planet. I'm doing this because I feel good about it. Mm. And once you get that and get these guys out of the, the picture, or at least in the negative sense, and you can grab hold of that emotions there, then you're a long, long way forward. Yeah. But can we do that with technology? Yes. Yeah. Can we communicate it? We need to find new ways. Yeah. That's why you've got this paradigm shift button. Yeah. Because we're all rooted in the, in, yeah. the, in the way in which we do things yeah. just now. It, sorry to carry no, on no, the no, conversation if you're okay. If you look in this blogging space, you, you have people like uh, the food babe and the, the frequency of hits by comparison to the scientific bloggers. Mm -hmm. Is again, it's a it's a total, uh, to and that's really about spreading fear about food. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's it's, it's the classic news syndrome. You know, when was the last time you watched the news and heard good news? It doesn't doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, and if you're Scottish, it doesn't even happen in the sports sphere anymore. You know, we, we keep we keep losing. <laughs> but but good news is not something that sells, mm. and it's the same with the the bloggers. Fear and, and negativity, ooh, that'll get a big hit. And then you come in and, oh, by the way, there were several researches done 10 years ago. Forget it. You know, we need to change the way we communicate. And that's where we as scientists, I think, find it remarkably tough. Because if you take, um, I'm going to be nasty again, if you take an uneducated person, then they will much more freely change the way they have an opinion and change the way they express it. And then if you narrow that down and take an educated person, then they're much more focused on their opinion and they're much more focused on the way in which they express it. And then you narrow it down even further and you take it to a scientist. So by training, I'm a rheologist. So if I was going to suddenly take all of this and start talking rheology to you, some of you would be able to follow me. Some of you wouldn't, because you're not part of my tribe. But I would find it remarkably difficult to dumb my rheology down so that you guys that were not part of the tribe would actually understand it. And yet then I failed. I failed to convey my message to the broad audience. And that's what we're doing here, I think. We're failing to convey the broad message, which is the science and the reason for doing this, to the broad audience because we get held back by needing to be accurate, by needing not to take compromises with our information, by needing to get the correct message across. Yeah, but what is the correct message if the rest of the population don't understand it? Somewhere along the lines, when we get into, into this area here, keep it simple. That's the biggest problem that we have. We have to keep it simple. We have to compromise on the type of information that we share. We've not to tell lies. We've not to compromise on the truth. But we can compromise on the way in which we tell the truth. And then have to try and do it in a fun way to mitigate the food babe, mm -hmm. whom I don't have experience with. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the risk that you have with these bloggers. They're very good at coming online. And that's why the big international food manufacturing companies, they really fear them. You know, brand security, a billion dollar brand. 
There's tons of them around. Billion dollar brands, that's big business. You don't want to do anything that will risk that billion dollar brand. No way. Brand security is king. And if you change a small piece of your formulation and all of a sudden have to take something off the label and put something else on, who's going to notice? I'm not going to notice. They will. And they'll be straight there. Bang. And if it's negative, it'll go out very quickly. And then the newspapers and the rest of the media will jump on. And then that's back to where I threw out my, my plea to you earlier on. What do we do about it? Not, not our problem. So is the solution engage, educate, and influence? Not necessarily in that order. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I, I think, um, again, I'd also like to thank Neil for that sort of provocative and thought-provoking contribution there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.